The following episode is brought to you by Poison City Brewing, proud makers of Durban Poison Cannabis Lager, the beer that invites you to live your poison. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is here. It's real hip hop music from the soul, y'all. Yeah, check it. Uh, yeah. How's it going, guys? You got myself, Nasi Pizwani. I'm back again with another episode of Sludge Underground Podcast. And today, I've got a special guest host with me, Megan from Lemon Dove. Um, you're going to be doing this interview together. And we have a super awesome artist here. I actually knew about him through Megan. You know, she, she, she's she got all the all the info and whatnot. So it was I was really intrigued when, you know, I checked out some of the stuff and whatnot. And yeah, this is why I'm super excited for this episode. My homie, do introduce yourself. Let the people know who you are king slave bodice all the way from athlone cape town i'm a hip-hop artist neo soul indie reggae whatever all genres musician and uh, yeah that's basically the in a nutshell what the king slave is yeah bro and i want to i want to get some info from someone who is from you know the scene out in cape town what is sort of the state of it is it thriving you know let me in on that i think right now it's it's, it's a point where the right network is starting to be uh, to be made to have a successful Cape Town industry. Um, we have amazing talent. I'm talking about the world-class level shit. And we know what we have. And a lot of big corporate investors haven't invested in Cape Town's music industry as much as they invested in other parts of, of South Africa. But um, it, it always blew my mind that Cape Town wasn't as popular as it, as it should be musically, even though Cape Town is one of the most known tourist attractions in the world. So it just blew my mind that, that uh, how can Cape Town's music scene not be as popping as the Cape Town uh, place itself? So right now, I would say the Cape Town scene is uh, growing extremely fast. We're starting to catch up. We, I, I know we make, there's a really great artist here that make brilliant music and, um, I think it's 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 gonna just take a couple of years, but I think Cape Town's music industry is gonna boom very soon when it comes to national and local appeal. Yeah, and when you sort of look at Cape Town, bro, and your sort of upbringing, you know, which are sort of are there any Cape Town artists that you might have maybe grown up sort of looking at and thinking, yo, you know, I want to be just like that guy. With the majority of the artists that pull through, you know, it's always influences from like overseas, United States, and whatever. If it is the local guys, it will obviously be the mainstream guys. You know, for you as someone in Cape Town, bro, is there any sort of local legend or anyone from Cape Town that you sort of looked up to? Yes. Growing up, I was more, in, I was definitely influenced by international music much more. And that's okay. You know, that's not a problem. I, I actually, I love, I love international music, but there are a couple of, I think I was inspired uh, by Jonathan Butler. He was one of the first like to go that big internationally, be on the billboard, you know, in, in the eighties, um, internationally. So Jonathan Butler was definitely someone I, I, I looked up to with uh, his musical ability skill and how he entered the, the, the game in the 80s. So Jonathan Butler, definitely. I think Tali Peterson, for what he done for the culture as well, I, 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 I was very... Really, I'm sad I didn't know more of him before he died. I only think that I wanted to know more of him after he passed. But um, Tali Peterson and David Kramer, what they've done for Cape Town and the music scene and, and those kind of things, I, I did look up to them, but mostly international though. That's the truth. But I did, I do have certain Cape Townian influences. While we're on that point, bro, before before I let uh, Megan jump in as well, you know, your your international influences, bro, you know, dive deeper into that there. I'm going to go from a, a, wild, a wide array of, of, of genres, but I'll say Young the Giant is the indie, is my favorite band of all time. Um, then I have Sting. I love Sting. I love Amy Winehouse. I'm super Bob Marley fan. Michael Jackson. 3D Mercury, I love Queen and 3D Mercury. Um, Hip hop wise, it's probably Wu Tang Clan, Big Pun, Snoop Dogg, Tupac. He has a lot of Tupac. Yo, I can go on for days. I can literally go on for days. But I could say that I'll, I'll round it off to that for now. And Ray Charles as well, and Michael Bolton. Yeah, oh, I'll have to add them. Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah, if I'm going back to the jazz days. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm gonna go. I'm going. I'm going off the train. But yeah, that's basically. In a nutshell, yeah. I can really sense that in your in your material, um, you really do a, a stellar job of blending all of those genres into one solid sound. And the way you yeah. 
I've been listening to your discography and I like to listen to um, a musician's material, like sort of from their start to their latest. And your growth has just been so amazing to listen to as an experience, as a full story, really. It's, it's been beautiful. Thank you. Yo, thank you. That's, that's a big blessing. That's a lot. That's really nice of you to say. Um, I've always wanted to just make my music grow and, and grow with my music simultaneously, like become a better person as my music gets, gets better. That's always yeah. been like one of my things I've always wanted to do. So, um, yeah, right now I'm at a point where I'm making, um, how can I say this? It's like, uh, the people I used to idolize, I do not idolize as much anymore. I just know that they make great music and now I feel as if I've got to the level where I'm like, yo, I can do what they did and I can do something a little different and more. So I'm at a point in my career where I'm starting to fully believe in, in my musical ability against anyone on any track. So how big, how famous, doesn't matter. So that's the point I am in my career now. So the growth to, the, to this point Yo, I can, I can tell you it's been a, a mad journey. I can definitely see that. Like, um, especially with your, your last, I think, three releases, it's been an explosion. Like, you are really coming through. You're, you're hitting hard on the message and you're making music that you should be really proud of. Thank you so much. One of the things that, you know, we, some of the pieces of content as well that, you know, Megan has been sending me, you know, through, through the days is your sort of rendition of, well, you did, this is South Africa, you know, so just let us in on that there, bro. What was sort of your mind state when you sort of made that, you know, and how much of the original one by Childish Cambino would you say, you know, assisted in you creating this? I saw the, the this is how, this is America video and I realized um, I want to do it, but it's just I, I saw a really great uh, I saw a vision for the Cape, particularly Cape Town being the main foundation, the Cape culture, gang culture being the main foundation of this is South Africa the rendition I did. That's what I what I plan to do. But um, the ga- Cape gang culture and poverty in general all still linked up, and that's why I tried to I still named it this is South Africa. Because my mindset was, this, the, the, what he did, Childish Gambino, was cause a world, like, a surge of consciousness musically. Like, you listen to the song, everyone was like, yeah, he's not, like, yes, he's right, that is happening. And he's doing it in a way that's commercially viable. And, and I thought to myself, I need to do it because I, I feel like it could do well and speak a, a message to Cape Tonians especially particularly the gang culture. And uh, that's what that's where my mindset was. It's really interesting that you mentioned, you know, the gang culture in, in Cape Town. And I know this is very much, you know, focused on you as an artist and as a musician. But uh, I'd really like to get from you, you know, is that sort of gang culture something that has ever affected you, you know, directly? And when it comes to your music, it is also something that we can maybe get elements of in terms of your experiences with that kind of stuff, if any at all. When you grew up in Cape Town, uh, if you're not sheltered off and you don't, you're not the introverted type of person and use this type of energy, which is mean, I, I do love to, to network and meet people and meet into and have new experiences. In Cape Town, you're just going to be exposed to certain things that is culture. We know already that there's certain areas you go there. That's a, that's, that's some, that's some, some G shit going down there. You need to know who you're with. It's like there's certain things you learn as a Cape Townian young about being street smart, whether you in the streets or out of the streets, you still have to have a level of street smart in Cape Town. So you learn, you you mind, you you get open to a lot of these underworld things and these gangs and shit, and, and and you you understand that there's a culture that has been is deep rooted, and unfortunately the roots is toxic. The roots has become toxic. I think the seed was not toxic. It could have grown into a great brotherhood, but it turned into gangsterism. So. Um, I'm I'm definitely inspired by my city's my city's demons, I would say. And it's close to art because yeah, I have gone through some crazy not crazy shit. I've met some crazy people. You know, my father's passing as well was I always use it as a as an example. That's what motivates me. My father's passing, yes. Uh, he was seven I was seven, sorry, he was murdered. And you know, he was a, a cop as well. Mm-hmm. And he was murdered by gangsters. So it's like, it hits close to me. That's why I have a message because I, I've, 
I felt the pain of, of what gangsterism can cause. You can lose like a parent. And it's not nice to grow up without a father. You actually would like to, to have a father. It's the best thing. So uh, in these streets, the culture of geno- uh, cultural genocide, or not a cultural genocide, I'll say just genocide. Then. It's just they're killing off the fathers, man. Most of the men are dying. Kids are growing up without fathers. They're just becoming this vicious cycle of the same thing. So my, 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 my war, my war is not, I don't have any beef with any rapper. I have beef with poverty, corruption, rape, murder. That, that's the beef I have as an artist. The, the type of visuals that you use in your, your music videos, where you, um, you insert text on the screen and it's kind of like, um, uh, an underlying message. And, um, if you're, if you're just listening and you're not looking, like you'll miss it. Um, can you talk to me about those sort of, those messages that you you put in your visuals. I uh, are you talking about the mini visuals? Because I think I've done it on a couple of them. Yeah, you see, you it, it seems to be sort of something that you 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 do. Yeah. Um, I've seen it on um, the the lyricist of the year visual. That was that was crazy. Yeah. That was good. Yes, thank you. Um, I know that it's my duty as an artist to to push a message that that, that, that that's that's pure and healthy and not toxic. It's a the antidote to what society has given us or what we've grown into. So um, I put these little messages in there because you're watching this thing, you're seeing the, the crazy artistic visuals and then boom, you see this whole message and that's what I want, man. You know, it's like a marketing strategy, but I'm using marketing in the right way, if you know what I mean. Like you can use marketing, like certain things are marketed in a way by big corporations, which are unhealthy to certain people. Now I'm using the same method they're using. I'm using... Um, the clickbait, all those things, but I am, I'm using it in a positive way to have a message with it. So that's why I do those little uh, messages in between those songs. Uh, I want people to think because when 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 when, when something hits you, sometimes someone can listen to my music and won't get it the first time. They watch it, they watch it the second time. When it actually hits you, it hits you hard. The epiphany I'm trying to create or spark in the listener's ear is um, one of my musical goals is to to make sure people can have epiphanies via music. So that's that, that's the answer to that, why I do that. Well, I, I think you definitely hit the mark on that. Like the way you, you match your visual to your message and the way you use your lyrics, but then you your vocal style while you're saying certain words amplifies that message so much more. It's really powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that is beautiful. And and sort of now looking at your your roots, bro. I'm trying to see if we can break this down from where it all began before you let us let us in on, you know, how long ago you started making music. Uh the one thing that just hits you square in the face is that name, bro. How did you, you know, coin it? Uh, I was called um Boris. Um someone someone in grade six, I was in primary school. There was a cartoon he used to sit next to me. We were best friends at the time. I looked at him and I said like his name was Wade. And Wade was like, yeah, Byron. That's my, re- my real name is Byron. And he was like, um, this guy looks like you. It was a little cartoon. And the sketch, It was the guy's name was Boris. And he's like, I think I'm going to call you Boris. And because he was the most popular guy at school, right? Because he called me Boris, everyone decided to call me Boris. And that stuck with me from primary school into high school. Whoever knew me from primary school, because I went to Garlandale Primary and I went into Garlandale High. So that stuck with me my whole high school as well. So I just rolled with it, right? And then I released my first mixtape and I needed a name and I called myself King Boris. Because I was like, you know, even though I thought it was probably cuck whack, I don't I don't want to listen to that shit. That was probably whack, but I felt like, yeah, I'm the king, nigga. Yeah, I'm the king, nigga. I felt like I had like soldier boy confidence. <laughs> I was a confident soldier boy. So I released the tape and then what happened is I felt really cool. I was living my best. I was like, yeah, I'm a rapper now. You know, when you get into the game and it was doing well, the downloads were doing really dope. And then um, I released, I lost my job after like a week after I released that project. I was like broke for a couple of months. And then two to three months later, I released Slave Bodice. I changed my name to Slave Bodice. And people were like, what the fuck is this nigga doing? And I was like, look here. Guys, I lost my job and I released a mixtape called Slave Bodice the Second. So the first mixtape was called King Bodice the First. The second mixtape was called Slave Bodice the Second. And then I realized without me knowing, yeah, I changed names, but the experiences I experienced was that 
my highest egotistical self and I was working and I had crew and I was just partying, I was just getting boss. That was the egotistical self, was that king, that royalty. I was just thinking, putting myself on a pedestal. However, when I lost my job, yo, I was making slave type music like I felt in the gutter. I was down and out. So when it came to that point, I told myself, no, 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 no. There's, there's something, something's calling me king, slave, goddess. There's a duality that you understand. You're living through a duality. So um, it just matched with king, slave, goddess. And then I released a project from Nature's name, King, slave, goddess. But I love King, slave, goddess as a message now. I, I believe that you to live like a king. You do still need to grind like a slave. And as an African man, I believe everyone on this soil is royalty. So I call everyone kings and queens. That's what I believe in. But I, I never lose sight of the change that was put on us. You know what I mean? I never lose sight of our history and I never want that history to repeat itself in that way again. And um, unfortunately, we're still stuck in a, very, in a very sad time in South Africa. But yeah, in simple terms, that's how the name came about. And that is solid, bro. And obviously, how long ago did you start making music? Well, as a toddler, I was playing with a spatula. I was running around with a spatula as a guitar. So I'm, I mean, I was very extrovert, uh, extroverted child. So I I started singing at seven. I, I used to listen to Backstreet Boys. Yep, you heard me correct. Yep, <laughs> yep. The streets gonna laugh for that one. The streets gonna laugh. <laughs> uh, Backstreet Boys in sync. Uh, my sister was uh, in high school at the time and I was influenced by whatever she was listening to because she used to just have the cassette player and record the stuff. And then uh, I, I listened to even Spice Girls. I actually really like Spice Girls. There was something about them. I think I just smacked them all. That's why I smacked all the Spice Girls. And then from there, jazz, straight. So so seven from seven years old, I was starting to listen to jazz, like Frank Sinatra. That was the only thing I was doing, soul music. At Ten years old, I started rapping, writing raps, and joining my first rap crew, BBS, um, in primary school. But so I've been doing it since seven. I want to talk about something that you said in one of your videos where it was um, just a get to know you kind of um, kind of vibe and you, you were talking about um, mental health and you said something about depression and having yeah. healthy alone time. Um, yeah. I, I, think, I think if we talk about that for, for a second, it would be good just to maybe help some people who are feeling a bit low, especially if they've been isolated for a while. To defuse depression. You need to change perspective. Once you change perspective, depression doesn't have that much hold or power on you. So for years, for example, I'm going to freestyle this, but for example, certain things, something happens down, uh, in the day where you're supposed to meet up with someone and it doesn't work and you bummed and it brings up old feelings and childhood traumas and all these things in perspective. I'm sorry, and, 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 and the depression. And you're looking at it as, look at all the stuff that's coming towards me. It's negative. How do I live with myself? You know, it's like a snowball effect. That's what depression does. It waits for the weakest moment and then it snowballs. And when once you start changing your, your, your perspective on how you start to see things and start removing yourself from yourself, looking from, from the out, outside perspective, that, that is so vital for, for my life. When I lost my mom, for example, she passed away in front of me. I, I saw her die. Now, that is traumatic. I know it's traumatic. But I also knew that in this time, if I need to survive, I need to just be, just think about it soulfully. Think about it soulfully. Death is normal. Loss is normal. This is how the world works. And the, when you when you start accepting those things, you start letting go of the anxiety that depression, depression gives you. You're so anxious about everything. You want to know how I'm going to pay this. And, uh, okay, COVID, this COVID-19, oh, I have to wear my mask. That, those kind of things is, is just as, as an healthy as COVID itself. So in these kind of times where we're in, we have to change our mindset and our perspective on what is bad or and lower our expectations of certain things. We have this expectation to be happy. If you're not happy all the time, that's perfectly fine. We cannot be happy all the time. The expectation is what's also causing us to have this depression. We expect that the day must wake up Birds need to come flying in, dropping smarties. You know, we, we want magical shit like that, but it doesn't work like that. That's not how the world works. And once you change your perspective on that, you'll start understanding that depression 
doesn't have as much power as it, as, it, as, it, as, it, as it normally has on you, changing the perspective and how you see bad things happen to you. So I always lower my expectation of things. I love life, but I lower the expectation and I just enjoy every second. I'm, I love happy life. I only have one life. So why am I not tr- trying to do what I love? I don't want to die in a system. So depression, it's one of those things that you just need to focus and find your healthy coping mechanisms because each one can be creative about their coping mechanisms. Creativity is the foundation of problem solving. I always say that. So get creative with, with, your, with your childhood traumas, with, with dealing with them. Find ways that are healthy and creative to make you um, feel better. If taking jogs makes you a, gives you a certain type of feeling with music playing in your ears, that is a coping mechanism. Use it as a tool when you jog. Deal with, it, with your stuff. When you, get away, when you come back and you rest and you stretch and you shower, just know that what you did now, you exerted with those, 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 those toxic thoughts that, you, that you're running away. You know? You're know, pushing up the cardio. You, you're working on your physical attack. So many things that are attached to each other, but the wall kind of separates them so much that you don't know. Like you feel like you have to deal with them each individually when all of them are so interlinked. And when, once you change your perspective, they're all healthy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Am I am I, am I making sense? Hundred percent, bro. So much sense. That was that was super helpful. Yeah, and something interesting that you actually said there, bro, a line that I picked up, you said you don't want to die in the system, which actually reminds me of, of one of the tracks that Megan showed me of yours as well. You know, System Fooled You. So sort of get into that there, bro. What it, what was sort of the mindset bit behind that there? I, I'm, I'm, I'm recently, I'm really inspired by um, Afropop. I really love Afropop. As much as, as I'm not, super mainstream in that sense. Like you won't you won't see me doing some Taylor Swift shit. But I I love catchy pop melodies. I grew up on it. Like I told you in sync back to the boys, Freddie Mercury Queen. I love good pop music also. Not only I'm not only just a hip hop artist and a soul artist. I love good music all multi genre um I love good music in general. So when I made it I thought to myself, I want to do something Afro pop and I want something so melodic and, and catchy that the feeling feels like the people are dancing, there's people are drinking drinks out of coconuts, it feels like, woo! But the message is the total opposite. The message is a duality, it's the king slave. So the sound sounds so happy, but the message is the total opposite. And that's what I want to do, because I'm and a happy melody is sticking in people's heads, but the message is going to stick in the head as well. So it's like, again, it's like sonic marketing to push a healthy message. Dr. Sebi, bro, he's, he's, he's well-renowned and stuff, you know, with, with what he did. And, and sort of, why, why, like, what is it about him that sort of drew you to sort of, you know, you know having his name in the title and, and sort of interlinking, you know, what he did with, with sort of your, the message that you're trying to push there? Sebi allowed me to get, to get closer to my roots. I've always pushed the Khoisan message. But when I started listening to Sebi, and what he had done and how he, he actually defeated the bigger system. And he was promoting healthy living. And that inspired me because I told myself, if I want to push a message, this is the thing, a lot of the messages pushed by certain artists, you know, they get killed or they die. Nipsey, Tupac, they die young and their message it carries on, but... Imagine someone lived longer and still had the same impact with that message. You know, Bob Marley used to die. Then. Now, if I can look after myself, look after my health, I can push this message as, lo- as far as I can with the grace of God and His protection. I can push this message for years, for decades, alive. So when I do finally pass, that message is deep-rooted. That's why. So, um, Sevi taught me about health. So I wanted to live healthier, so I stopped eating meat and I stopped drink, eating dairy. I started eating more alkaline, more electrical, because the body is better in an alkaline state. So I think the thing goes from 1 to 14, that's the, the pH scale in the body, and 7.4 would be your average. You know, every human should be 7.4 on the pH scale, which is alkaline, average alkaline. And when you're acidic, that's when disease forms. So Sebi believed in mucus being the only disease because every virus or infection needs to attach itself to a mucus 
to the mucus of the body or the mucous membrane of the body. So once you remove the excess mucus, uh, virus have a less chance of uh, manifest- manifesting uh, within the body physiologically, if that's correct. Like uh, this man was opening like my mind. I was like, what the fuck? And why the fuck is people not understanding like, yo, the food we are eating kind of is killing us. Not kind of, it is killing us. Like it's getting us hooked on poles. We need the pharmacy. Even though we know that the f- uh, tablet only masks a core, a, 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 an issue. It doesn't take it away. It masks it for, it fools the brain's chemistry to believe that everything's fine at that point. And you don't feel the pain. It's changing the chemistry of the body. Right? But it's not doing, once it wears out, the pain is still there. Why would I not want to take these herbs and live a herbal life? So I'm, I'm, I'm truly an African herb man. I take my herbs everywhere I go. If I'm performing, I got herbs with me. And I got all the herbs, man. I look for all the weirdest herbs. I take the weirdest things from all over the world because I really want to explore how can I be the healthiest person or teach this to other people and we can have a community of just healthy ass people. I'm not saying meat is bad. I just think the meat we have is bad. What do I need to chow in order to, to, to boost that alkaline? It's like a lot of stuff like avos are electric, ginger is electric, turmeric is electric, rosemary, thyme, nettles, artemisia. There's so many plants and, and fruit and veg that are electric. And I can't go through all of them right now, but I know I went off them. My mind does this. I, I go so far off on the train in the journey. But um, to go back, the reason why I named it Sebi, <laughs> the reason why I named it Sebi, I wanted to get people, I wanted to capture them with a neo soul vibe. So I, I came with a, a kind of like a love story kind of vibe. It explains me and it goes through like a, a flirtatious temp storyline with this, with this girl. Right? That's why it's Sebi. But I made sure that I can throw in the word Sebi because I felt like I'm going to market Sebi's mi- mindset and the healthy living in a neo soul, funky, sensual way. You know what I mean? Um, I'm, I'm glad you, you took took some time to talk about the healthy and healthy eating and healthy living. I was wondering um, about your martial arts since we were talking about health and, and I'm sure like with the diet comes the lifestyle. So you are a martial arts athlete. Please tell me more about that. I, I started um, training late in my life. My father was a third degree Dan in karate. So I would say it's in my family blood, but no one in my family took it up. I took it up late in life, but I caught up so well. I really love, I love martial arts. It's, it's the same level as music for me. It's like I'm making melodies with my body. It's like, I don't like conflict. I don't like negative conflict. It's not nice. That's what right is in someone's energy. But I love combat. The respect, the discipline. You lose, you understand why you lost, you get better. I love that. And I don't know why I love it. But um, I trained at Top 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 Primate Academy, Fight Academy in town. I, I started with Cape Town Fight Club first. And then I had a coach, Rowan um, Katsu, great man, super dope coach. He, uh, he made me level up in ways I can't even thank him. And my obsession with, with martial arts pushed me. Like I was training at least five hours a day, even if I'm not in the gym six hours a day, over a period of like four or five years. So martial arts is a part of me. I've done all the martial arts, but I'm, I'm basically, I'm a foundationist boxing in K1. And boxing is my favorite. Could we see you in the octagon uh, in the future there, bro? You know what? If God allows, that is my path. And, uh, you know, bless, bless the ancestors onto me, but I, I, I definitely would love to do that. I would love to do that. I like... I, I, I love it that much. I love the combat vibe so much that, yes, I would like to be in the EFC if 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 I have the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know, 100%, bro. And and also now, um, you are actually uh, uh, a South African Hip Hop Award nominee, bro. What were you nominated for? And how did that sort of make you feel when you when you found out that, hey, I'm actually, you know, nominated in one of the, probably the biggest, you know, South African uh, hip hop based sort of awards, bro? I was so I was signed to IMG back then. We all got nominated um, for Kings of Western Cape, and by that time, I was the lead artist of the of the record record label. So it was a it was a huge thing because you know this never happened for Cape Town like that out of nowhere. You know that the label itself was a year old, and I got signed in like a couple of, like yeah like just before a year, and 
we go, we, we, oh, it was like, it was such an amazing experience because look, we were just coming up in the industry. Like right back then, I had so much to learn about this game. And, um, 2017, we go, we pull up, we basically put our money together. We all worked hard. It was a brotherhood at this, this label, Immaculate Music Group. We were just a bunch of hardworking young niggas just trying to achieve it in this it's an industry. Side note, Zeno D, you know, we would use some of the SEC's biggest tracks, SMA, things like that. He came from IMG, Linux Beats, super producer, IMG. These people, he worked with so many big names already. And so it was just like we all went split our own paths. But um, back then we were all together. We got nominated and it was really dope. But Ready D won our category, Kings of Western Cape, which was weird. <laughs> I didn't understand it. Like, I'm honest, man. I was like, man, last year you got the Lifetime Achievement Award. Why the fuck are they giving you another award if you've got the main award of all time? I was like, no, nigga. Like, this is not even eight. No, this is logic. This is just fucking logic. I don't know. That's what I truly believe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all love to Reddy D. Legend in the game. He's a grandmaster. Major mad respect. I'm just saying, yo, bro, if you win the Lifetime Achievement Award, you do not get more awards. You should not get more awards. Yo. So, are, are you... Okay, I'm not saying you're saying this, but, like, do you think that maybe... Um, or rather, do you share the same sentiments and say maybe the likes of Ricky Rick that met, that one day said, you know what, these awards here are rigged and I'd rather not be a part of it. Would you say maybe that's sort of an element that you might have sensed considering, you know, he got the award and then now he, he then goes and gets that award that you're at, you know, could have been yours, bro? I know what Ricky Rick says and why he says it. But I don't have any feeling towards that part of the industry. I'm on a Bob Marley path. My path is righteousness, revolution, and good music. That's the path I'm on. I do not see the industry in the way other people do it. I see it. I see the the, the, the positives, the negatives, the bads, the goods. I don't deal with it. I don't emotionally attach myself to that, to that part of the industry. So when he wins, he wins. It doesn't matter to me. I know what, what I need to do is win the people over and start changing people's hearts. You know what I mean? That's what I believe. Yeah, before I pass on to, to, to Megan real quick, um, just on that point that you were mentioning there with uh, IMG, as, as an artist who has had that experience of being signed, you know, previously, what sort of differences would you say there are, you know, from, you know, a, 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 as an indie artist and also then as an, an artist who has been sort of under a label or has been signed? I've achieved more as an independent artist. I've achieved more of myself. I've made more money for my brand as an independent art, artist. As a label, a lot of the sharing, that's the thing. A label is sharing. The bigger you go up, the more you share. So, uh, look, the record label culture, they can offer you a 360 deal and give you a couple more, whatever. It's, it's still a loan. It's like going to the bank and getting a loan. It's not as, as flashy as you think. Yes, it looks really flashy because that's how it's marketed. It's flashy. To get a record deal, it's like, ooh, let's get a chat. But it's actually much more complex than that. And it's quite encouraging if you're a, a free creative. I can't be caged. There's nothing in my being, in my spirit that can cage, can be caged. I don't like that kind of authority. Mm-hmm. So independent was the best way I went for me, for my personality. My grind matches my personality. I'm not going to grind in a way that doesn't match my personality. That's going to make me sad and depressed and I'm going to feel out. And I don't know what I want them myself. But my grind matches my personality. I'm free spirited and I, I treat my, my career in, in independent like that. I, sometimes I don't overly think and plan my career. I just I put capitalize on every opportunity I feel is a good opportunity and that helps me. You know, sometimes you work, I work hard and I work smart. I don't choose between the two. Yeah, I really respect that. And that's like your independent game is something that I'm, I'm definitely following. It's been an interesting ride to say the least. Uh, what are you working on right now? What I've done is I've, I've started working with multiple multiple producers all over Cape Town, and I'm just hopping on their beat. So I just pull up to the studios, right, and I record on their beat, and then leave, and I don't know what I record. And then I just come the so next time I come through, they're like, dude, the song. So I'm trying to make hits with every producer I meet. Because I know what makes a hit, what, what the structure is, and how to make it my own. The only difference is the amount of people hearing it. That's what makes a hit. Some people make hits in their bedroom, but not enough people hear it, so they won't become a hit. But 
you think about the structure and the melody and you're like, oh, this is a catchy ass song. Some of your friends make hits, but they just don't get the views. So what I'm trying to do right now is make hits and make conscious bangers. So right now I'm working on an EP, a mixtape, and the album is still in the, in the works. I love working on multiple projects because my mind is like that. Like uh, it does a lot of things at the same time. I'm probably ADHD, but I just never went to go find out. But it's okay because the weed really helps. But um, right now I'm just making a lot of music everywhere I can. Multi-genres from deep house. I'm a piano, Afro pop, trap, hip hop, soul, jazz. I'm jumping on anyone's beats. And can we expect any, you know, release dates in terms of any any of your recent material? You know, something that you might have planned, you know, in terms of release. I think the only thing you will be seeing now is more often you're going to see a lot more visuals dropping. There won't be projects as to say. There'll be a lot more visuals, music videos, and and things like that. Because I'm, I'm I'm designing my own style of of visuals now, and I like it. What's the difference between a commercial falling and a cult falling? A commercial falling is like if you're hot, you are. If you're cold, you're your fans fuck off. Well, a cult falling is like people understand your personality and they they stick with your your music and your and your your shit for years to come. Longevity. So in the end, the the cult falling, longevity, independent career is a big option. I don't even know what question or what I'm what I'm answering, but I'm talking and I'm loving it. I love this. I love this book. Dude, like a point of interest, something you mentioned, um, uh, 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 you know, earlier on was uh, BBS Rap Crew, one of your first, one of the first sort of groups you were you were part of. Tell us a bit more about that, bro. Were you guys out there doing, you know, Backstreet Boys covers? You know, I want it that way type vibe because I would have been so there for that. But um, let us in on 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 BBS, bro. Byron Prince Akile. That's literally why we called it BBS. That was the name of the album. Byron Brent. Sakile. Fire. No, well, that was it. We were just like, what's our coolest name? Just take our name. Our first letters is to it. And then it, it stuck with us. Um, we were just rapping in interval, writing music. And we wanted to be like, yeah, they're called BBS. We used to be like, yeah, prime school, just walk around. BBS, yeah, BBS. But I battle everyone. We want to write bars over all the school holidays, come back to show off in interval. Yeah, that was the life. That was BBS in general. It was like grade four, five. It was really... Very long time ago. Uh, I think everyone's got that one mock band that they started just to just to keep <laughs> the dream. You know, obviously, just one aspect that I'd like for us to get in is sort of more like a social issue with with this thing that's been happening in South Africa with the whole gender based violence thing, bro. Um, what what is sort of your role? What is what role is 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 Boris sort of playing when it comes to sort of you know tackling that there? Changing is changing the mindset of men, changing uh, elevating the consciousness of modern men. That's the problem in society. Modern men are taught and we are raised fucked up. We are raised fucked up and we, it, 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 it manifests in toxic ways and toxic action. So that's, that's, that's what the message I'm trying to push out to other men. Just how I, like I, I saw that my toxic shit, but you can, you can still have a good life and have fun and not try to rape or kill a woman. You know what I mean? I think our foundation of our, our culture with, with the gender, with gender at least is short, systematically flawed. It's, it's very sad. Men are taught to keep in their emotions, don't cry. Then that desens- they desensitizes the child. Child starts not talking about his feelings, starts becoming colder. These things is what creates sociopath, you know, in the future. It just takes a, a traumatic experience to send this person over the edge and all these things accumulate and can create something like a rapist or murderer. See? So our upbringing as a, as as men is flawed. It's it's fundamentally flawed because they they've numbed men emotionally, and we are emotional creatures by nature. Don't believe it because you're a man, you're less emotional. Those same feelings in neurons connect the same as in a woman. You know, women are just naturally more nurturers. They are catalysts for growth. There's certain things that I I know with with the genders like yo, men have a there's a reason why there's man and woman. There's certain there's an energy that both bring that once they find in the neck or the sweet spot of a relationship, it's almost unstoppable. That's the goal is to open up men more emotionally, become more emotionally intelligent. That's why I tried to push that message. Because emotionally intelligent, emotional intelligence is probably super it's the most key when it comes to becoming a better person. 
higher emotional intelligence normally means a better person or a better a good a better human being. I think it's really nice to see a man able to open up and be comfortable and to seek out depth in emotions rather than to avoid them. One of the things I noticed is your 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 ink, man. All these tattoos, bro. What are they about? Let me know. I see there was like a there's a neck piece there, chest piece. You know, let us in on that, bro. I got katanas on my chest, and I have a samurai a samurai home, like a Japanese home style home. I call it the samurai home because I just call it that. But the Japanese style the home, and then I got chrysanthemums on my Japanese style chrysant chrysanthemums, which is for plants. I got um, uh, a samurai on my arm. I, I like Japanese culture. I just like the culture of it. But um, that's 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 majority of my tattoos is Japanese. And then um, I have this is this is normal. It's, it's, a, it's a rose. This is Charlotte, my grandmother. She raised me. The lady that that I told you earlier, like I spoke about, that passed away in front of me after she passed away. This was my coping mechanism. You know what I mean? And I really saw the two choices: lose my shit. Because basically, I didn't grow up with a father. So my mom raised me while my mommy was working most of the time. So my mom is my mother. So your mother dies in front of you, in essence. Second mom dies in front of you. And you're like, yo, um, what do I do? Do I get angry at the world? Because when you have that kind of pain and you lose someone, you get angry. Luckily, my mom installed a lot of things about death that made me deal with it better. And this was one of the ways I dealt with it. I put a name on my neck initially and the, and the tattoo, my tattoo guy was like, let me put the rose on it. And I'm like, are you sure? It, on some real shit, I was like, are you sure, bro? Because I don't know how much that was going to cost. Uh, that's some real nigga. Huh? What are you talking about, a rose? What, what, what's my pocket like? Because I had cash. He said cash. I was like, damn, look, if I'm going to say it, I'm, I'm just going to pay, pay this to tell me this. And he didn't even expect anything. He didn't even charge extra. He was like, yeah, I want to do it for you. And he put the rose on my, on my, on above Charlotte. And that was probably one of them sweetest things any human has ever done for me in that sense like yo it was, it was a beautiful thing um, I'm an animated character so that, that's the one for my neck the the one on my arm is just I, I really like this little animated but I, I feel like that's my character man I'm just like a a, a ronin a, 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 so, a solo samurai that in the industry and I'm just you know koisan samurai it out just enjoying my my vibe living by a good culture that's why I feel close to the, to the Japanese culture, as just as, not just as much as African culture, but second to African culture. My favorite culture is Japanese. So the, the katanas on my chest is, is, was very deep. That's a very deep message because I got it because I wanted to realize, I wanted to remind myself that these swords represent a motto I live by. There are two swords in defense, so they kind of cross over each other, so they're defensive. So they basically, I always remind myself, okay, because I put them over my chest, I remind myself every time I look at them, like, yo, I must protect myself. I must defend what's good. I must protect my, my spirit, my energy from other toxic and, and, and poisonous and venomous people and spirits. I, I know this, this is why I put it on my chest to remind myself. But I also remind myself that it's full katanas and they can still cut. So I still have, I'm very sharp with my message. I want people to know I attack with a message as much as I defend my message. So that's why the katana is, is on my chest in that design crossover in a defensive position. I'm just excited to hear more of your music, to be honest. I've been absolutely swimming in it today. I have favorite signatures that you do. Like you yeah. have certain vocal effects that kind of remind me of like almost dub and like reggae yeah. vibe. And um, you have you have like these R and B signatures, like these little runs that, yeah. like especially in um, "Run Into My Life," uh, I, I like um, the Mandela track. Oh, so they did the, the harmonies that you did on that. That that those were so great. That was a that was a really good song to create. I want to make classics, man. That's my goal. I want to make classical classics. Like, whenever you listen to the music, you go back, you're like, you know what? This is timeless. I'm trying to make timeless modern music. Whether it's trap, even if it's trap music, I want to make timeless trap music. I want to make music that you can literally listen to 500 years from now in an aid inspiration and be like, this human, this, this, new, this, this nigga knew what he was doing. Like, you know, um, I always ask the question, like, what is your favorite? Because it allows me to know what people love the most. And Running to My Life is actually one of them that a lot of people love. 
And I always think back and I'm like, it's a very simplistic song. It's not much, not much vocals, not much lighting, not much done, but it's just done enough to capture and impact the listener. So thank you, Lemon. You're welcome. I'm also a big fan of Guavana, but like, I can't really pick when it comes to ups and faves. Uh, I, I like, I like, I like it as a catalog. Thank you, too. Thank you so much, Big Blessing Queen. Listen, bro, I want to I wanna sort of, uh, uh, I know I said final aspects on the tattoos, but I just want to find out how you've sort of been engaging, you know, in your fans when it comes to, you know, considering lockdown and the pandemic. How have you sort of been making sure that they're, they're sort of up to date with whatever you're doing? I realize that lockdown, you know, if a lot of artists were like, yo, that's our biggest paycheck is cut. Even I was like, yo, gigs is what I actually make my money on mostly, is doing gigs. That's how I get the bag. I do gigs everywhere I can, and I get bags at these places. More gigs, more bags, more stability in my career. So when lockdown happened, it threw you off. But what lockdown did do is cause people to be on their phones more. So now you have a chance to be more popular, and that's what I did. I decided to increase my popularity, gain new cult following fans, make better music, and just introspectively deal with myself every day, face my shit, that I'm going through and write about it, make music about it. And that is why I think I'm leveling up as an artist is because lockdown allowed me to look within myself and to see the world as well, differently. Last thing, I am I'm wondering about the the last piece that you posted, um, Puffing on Revolution, the live performance. Like, How did that come together? It seemed so natural and yet like spontaneous. Um, I don't know, like how did that, how did that play out? Super spontaneous. So puff, puffed with them like 15 minutes before, met the band, then played them one of my tracks. They were like, while we walk into the to the instruments, we all cuddled around a phone with our mask on, trying to listen to the track. And then when I got to the steps before that, like before there's like you just guns all dead, and there's the perform uh, the, the instruments. But as we walk up the steps, he's like, hey, bro, play it out here to the to the keys player. I ran over to the keys, Danny, play to him, he's like, got it. I'm like, Owens, play. And that happened. We at the energy clicked, man. Plus, I, I truly believe I'm a savant at music. I know I don't have to know the band. I just need to feel the energy of the people playing the instrument and I will be able to figure out what they're gonna do. And that's what I, exactly what happened. Nothing is planned, nothing is scripted. That is just basically feeding off each each other's energy at the right times, making it look like we practice, but we didn't practice at all. It was a really dope experience. The best live performance I've had with a live band ever. Yeah, like that's that's what most musicians hope to have in, in on their best day. And it, it just looked like such a good time. I wish, I wish I could have been there. Yeah, but you, you look, I, I, wanna, I, I know after lockdown, that's the one thing I want to do. I need to go all over. No, with Josie, because I performed in Josie, I performed in South Africa, all over South Africa, but I need to do it more consistently. And lockdown, you can't do it right now, but that's 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 the next level is to perform more consistently in in all well, all over South Africa. And and I'll pull up to anywhere your side, do a show there. Y'all need to pull through. Uh, we've learned a lot about you. Uh, I'd like to also to just thank Megan as well. Like I said, bro, when you began this, she is the catalyst of this episode even happening because, you know, she basically came through and was like, yo, dude, check this homie out. He's super dope. And, you know, from what I've learned in this episode, bro, I'm super keen to just dive into that discography myself. And I really hope that everyone else that's been listening is keen on doing the same. So uh, in closing, bro, where can people sort of get in touch with you? What are your handles? And yeah. King Slave Bodice. You can just basically um, search King Slave Bodice on Google. Um, verified on Google. <laughs> <laughs> Young Flex. <laughs> Young Flex. <laughs> um, um, so you can Google King Slave Bodice. Um, you can go on Facebook, King Slave Bodice, at King Slave Bodice on Insta. I am on Twitter. There's nothing on Twitter. I don't use Twitter. I have a Twitter account. I think it's Bodice Slave King. So it's back. It's basically my name. Back to front, what? Oh, I don't know how to say that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's basically just King Slave Bodice anyway. He's only one person on the earth named that. We need to play out with a song of yours, bro, but before we get to that, shout outs. Shout out to the creator. Shout out to my mother, 
Shout out to my family. Shout out to my support structure. Shout out to my brotherhood. Um, shout out to the Real Men Alliance. Shout out to King Slave for his fans. Shout out to my dog, Bison. I miss you, my dog. Oh, wait, Bison. I'm going to see you. I'm going to play. I'm going to throw my, I'm gonna throw ball to you. Don't worry. I will be there. And then, it's just a big shout out. Shout out to Dante the Dante. Shout out to Kano, my brother. Shout out to the tribe. Dubs and Carter, Capetonian guys. You can definitely check them out. Please do check them out. They have amazing stories and they super talented. Dante the Dante. You can, we can link up. We can, we can talk about it in, in, uh, in the DMs, but shout out to you guys. You guys were so dope. I love interviews like this. It's just free flowing. It's a like dope discussion, conversation. Cause I'm like speaking sometimes and I, especially when I go on a trip. You know, sometimes I drop James, sometimes I talk cack, but ultimately I love just experiencing a good a, a good vibe. So thank you for your good vibes. Oh, we're solid, bro. We thank you for being on the show. Um, what track of yours would you like for us to sort of close out with uh, for this episode? For the vibe, let's close off with From the Cup. Yeah, From the Cup. I think, yeah, let's go back to where I'm from. Oh, wait, no, that's dope, bro. Um, and yeah, guys, uh, obviously, um, this episode is going to go up uh, as usual on Apple Podcasts. We are Sledge Underground Podcast and on SoundCloud, Sledge Underground. And obviously on Spotify as well, Sledge Underground Podcast. Please do check us out on social media, Facebook, Sledge Underground, Instagram, at Sludge Underground, and Twitter, at Sludge 031. As for myself, it's at Zwane 031. Megan, thank you for joining us as well as a special co- uh I guess co-host please just let the people know where they can get in touch with you uh thanks so much for having me guys it's been such a treat um you can find me at lemon dove duo or at meager king boris you said uh what did you say the name of the track is one more time bro in closing yeah you can just check it out all me all major streaming platforms they can check out from the cab at f-r-o-m space d-a space cab Tops guys, enjoy the track until next time. It's bye for now. From the cup, hey, yeah, 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 from the cup, hey, yeah. From the cup, ay, yeah. From the cup, ay, yeah. Say, welcome to the wild, wild west, oh. What the prisons crowd, crowded, oh. wild in this town nowadays. Stucky just got sprayed at point blank range. Brother, we gotta stop that. The enemy laughing, oh, yeah. Keep the brown in the system, uh, to end up in coffins, uh, yeah, yeah. Numbers they pushing, uh, uh, they pushing up daisies, uh, uh, we're killing ourselves, uh, these drugs are crazy, uh. From the cup, ay, yeah, 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 from the cup. Place where the people talk of place, people to give you faith for your phone or your pay. Uh. Yeah, my people lost, my people lost, they bullets, they go on a stray. Yeah, dodging the cops, had and seek with the law while the night sleep in the day. Yeah, we have no silver spoons, but we know golden dish home and we stuck in our ways. Yeah. Look at people, we are not treated equal Government be lying, they be chicken, they be evil They corrupt, they be keeping all the secrets Too many young killers killing for the pennies Living and taking them drugs Yeah, uh, Causing these body drops When will it all stop? Uh, weapons be stealing the love How do we clean up the city hey, with dirty cops? From the cup, hey, yeah 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 From the cup, hey from the cop, ay, yeah. 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 